Um, my name is Alisa Sladzinska, and I work for the City of Chicago Department of Business Affairs and Consumer Protection, BACP. I want to welcome everyone to the BACP Business Education Workshop Webinar Series. We have adapted our regular business education workshops at City Hall into these webinars until further notice. On behalf of our commissioner, Rosa Escarino, I want to inform you that business licenses can be processed online where applicable by visiting chicagobusinessdirect.org. And any emails or websites that I mention, I will post in the chat, so you'll be able to reference them there. And if you are part of the BCP Entrepreneur Certificate Program, you can get credit for joining this webinar by sending an email to bacpoutreach at cityofchicago.org. If you want to learn about the program, please visit chicago.gov backslash business education. To help guide businesses and employees during Chicago's reopening process, including the new guidelines that are going into effect uh, this Thursday tomorrow, please visit chicago.gov backslash reopening. Also, BCP and the City of Chicago's Office of Emergency Management and Communications created Shy Biz Emergency Alerts. You can opt in to receive targeted emergency alerts for the business community. If you are interested, please visit chicago.gov backslash shy biz alerts. And today's webinar will be Expanding Minority Business Access, an Introduction to Government and Corporate Contracting. It will be presented by the Women's Business Development Center, WBDC, and CMSDC. Welcome, Anita. Well, thank you, Elizabeth. That was a great introduction. My name is Anita Hagen. I am with the Chicago Minority Supplier Development Council slash MBDA Center, located in the Chicago downtown area. And we have a fantastic 60 minutes in store for you today. We are here with the EMBA, which stands for Expanding Minority Business Access. We're going to spend, like I said, the next 60 minutes or so sharing how your business could grow through government and corporate contracting. So I need you to either get your iPad, uh, your laptop, or you can go old school with the pen and paper because you're gonna need to take plenty notes because we're gonna give you some information that is going to blow your mind. Next slide. We're going to, also, we're going to be talking about government procurement and corporate contracting. And here, whereas government procurement is selling to local, state, federal government agencies, you wanna know and tell everyone what uh, business, your business can sell uh, to government. And the same thing with corporate contracting will be discussed also and how to do business with corporations. Next slide. If you're here today, you're here because you want to expand your business. And that is what we, this program is all about, is assisting MBEs in the process of educating themselves on how to do business with government and also how to do business with corporations. Next slide. As we expand in different opportunities for the local and state and federal government contracting and including also utilities, uh, that have headquarters here in the Chicagoland area, along with uh, working in the neighborhoods. We want to also make sure that you are set up and set and able to land your large contract, which will be what, 
a million dollars because we all can stand for a million dollar contract as a business owner. And so those are the things that we will be going through and discussing with you all today. And I'm going to turn it over to Karen and she's going to continue getting you started. Perfect. Well, thank you so much, Anita. It's, uh, oh, let me just turn on my video too. It's exciting to be here with you today. Thank you for joining us. So as you can see, um, you know, here's what the slide says. There's millions of minority owned businesses in the United States. And uh, what we're um, about today, and we really appreciate BACP support in this, is to help um, minority businesses particularly and women owned businesses and just other businesses in general, but particularly minority owned businesses, um, identify how they can um, succeed in going after some of the contracts that uh, we're gonna be uh, talking about. So we've got um, you know, a number of success stories that we're gonna just kind of briefly go through along the way to, to I guess, um, talk about some of the specific things that small business owners have found to be, to be successful. And we're going to talk about, as uh, Anita said, both corporate contracting and government contracting, um, looking at what the general opportunities are, um, helping you figure out how you want to communicate your offer. We're going to talk about supplier inclusion or supplier diversity. Uh, we're going to talk about certification, about the bidding process, and then about ways that you can get additional free assistance. Corporate contracting and government procurement do have some things in uh, common. Uh, they also have some things that are different. And I see that my colleague, um, Jahan Chamba Diallo from the WBDCs just posted um, that if you have questions along the way, please do ask them using the Q&A. Um, I would encourage folks to introduce themselves if they want to in the chat, uh, making sure that you're uh, going to all panelists and attendees so that everyone can see you. Um, but if you have questions for us in terms of the program, please um, put them in the Q&A and it's just easier for us to sort of um, handle that. So um, there's lots of different businesses here um, in the program today. We've got at this point 61 attendees, which is just great. Thank you very much for making time to be here. Um, and you're gonna be in different points of your business, I would assume, um, not everybody's in the same stage. So if you're in the thinking about your business perspective right now, um, what you're going to learn, I think, can help you frame and shape the, the structure of your business so that as you grow, you become um, more well eligible for um, MBE certification and also uh, a, a better contractor, a better uh, vendor supplier for your customers. If you're a fairly new business, um, it could be that subcontracting might be a viable uh, path for you now. Uh, tier two subcontracting, people use different language to talk about basically the same thing, where you're not directly uh, selling to the city of Chicago or to Allstate, but you're selling to someone as part of a larger project. Um, and then if you've been in business, you know, a number of years and maybe you're a larger type of business, it might make sense for you to go after uh, directly after government contracting or um, corporate contracting or both, um, or also continuing that uh, the, the subcontractor option. A lot of businesses find that to be a very appropriate place to be. And of course, it depends on your industry as, as well. So gosh, uh, lots and lots of uh, spend out there, right? The, the federal government by itself is $4.8 trillion. Um, and the private sector uh, is, is uh, harder to quantify, but is a lot. It's bigger than 4.8 trillion for sure. And then there's lots of um, quote unquote smaller units of government like the city of Chicago, which the city of Chicago is smaller than the federal government, but it's a huge customer, Cook County, state of Illinois. So lots of opportunities. So now we're gonna talk about corporate contracting. Um, and Anita, do I turn it back over to you at this point? Uh, not yet. <laughs> okay, thanks. Sometimes I lose track of the slides. So let's talk just a little bit about, you know, what do corporations buy? So if you look at this picture, you know, obviously looks like an empty room, but you've got um, tons of different things. You've got furniture, you've got window washing, you've got carpet, you've got, obviously it was built at some point. So 
you know, just to kind of give you a sense of the of the variety, and that's not even talking about the professional services that the corporations buy as well. Excuse me, Karen, you want to turn it over to Sandra? Oh, I will turn it over to Chandra. Yes, thank you. Okay, so please forgive me. I'm having some a couple of technical difficulties. We cannot always rely on it as much as we like to, but um, I'll go ahead and we'll talk about some of the corporations um, and why they invest in supplier uh, inclusion. So there are many reasons why uh, people, you know, have these supplier diversity programs. So for smaller companies, um, corporations are dealing with smaller companies. They smaller companies have the ability to be a little more agile. So. Um, there are fewer approval levels. So if I am a co corporation and I'm purchasing from you, I need to, um, I can say that, you know, if there's something that we need to alter, you don't have not so much red tape because most of the time the decision ends with the decision maker who's the president who's usually able to uh, be easily reached and he can make changes as needed. Smaller companies are often able to offer more competitive pricing. There are more options to evaluate. Um, with there's a company um, if that's larger, there's more red tape that has to happen, but um, and um, it's not so easy to offer competitive pricing. Small, most small businesses kind of set their own price standards. A lot of small companies, because they do have the ability to be agile and, and, and change as needed, they can be innovative. If I am a buyer and I say, you know what, I would really like for you to uh, add an additional service component um, to what you're already providing, um, then, you know, it's easier for um, you to make those changes. Uh, reflection. So reflections upon customers who want their supply chain and workforce to look like them. So um, lots of times you want your uh, your uh, the suppliers that you're working with to be diverse. So you work with diverse suppliers. Next slide, please. So you might, you also want to think, what are your core competencies? What makes you stand out amongst your competition? So think about the products and services that you sell. Am I selling a product or service that um, not my, the person who, um, I'll use a pick on the IT industry, um, if I'm performing information technology services, do I provide something that my competitors don't uh, provide? Next slide. So we love success stories, and this is actually one of my favorite, um, and we'll talk about uh, Kara's engineering, and that's engineering services. Um, and she says, when a potential buyer says, what do you do? They don't want a long list of items or a bunch of uh, adjectives that such as unique, I'm unique, I have a quality service, I'm dependable. Well, everyone says that, you know, we all feel that those are our, our, our um, you know, cores with our company. Write what you do with what they have in mind. So you want to get to know who is it that you're purchasing from. Private sector companies, they always, they're always looking to be competitive, right? They want to stand out. So they want suppliers that are competitive as well. Next slide. You also want to explain your value and you want to talk about uh, what is it that, uh, like you, we said, uh, kind of stands out. So we'll kind of give some examples. So if you're a printing company, is it that you don't just provide print, you also provide promotional items, signage, event displays. Um, do you do some prototyping, coding, or machine learning? Um, urban farming, for example, uh, what do you do that's, uh, that stands you out, makes you stand out amongst your competition? Do you provide some form of organic food supplier? Think about those things and think about what makes you stand out and what brings value to your customer. Karen? Yeah, so um, I mentioned uh, supplier inclusion, supplier diversity earlier, and those are really um, the words for the same, the same thing. Um, within most large organizations, there's someone who does this function. And these are people who are uh, both an advocate for small minority diverse businesses, um, but frankly, more importantly, they're a resource to their corporation. And so to the buyers in their corporation. So they wanna help you 
but their primary job is to provide great diverse suppliers to the buyers. So um, when you're approaching them, you want to think about that too. You want to sell them, uh, just like um, as Chandra was saying, you're going to you're going to sell the customer. Now we've got um, a, a couple of questions, and um, one of them um, is is from a beauty salon and restaurant. Um, and Elisa, I'm going to ask you to kind of handle those because there's some specific questions to that, not so much in terms of what we're discussing today. Um, and then um, we have had some requests about whether the deck is going to be mailed out, and we will be sending out a PDF of the slides. Um, and we also have a handout that kind of coordinates with it as well. So that's that's going to be also coming out. Okay. Now I hand it back to Anita for certification. Yes, we want to talk a little bit now on certification and what certification is all about and the what certification also brings to the table for as an access and a tool for you to use when you are out seeking uh, contracts. Okay, a certification is what Chicago MSDC and WBDC uh, does for the corporation side. There's also certifications for the public side, which would be your, um, your state, your city, your county um, certifications, also your um, transit authority also have uh, certifications there too. And so with your certification, it's a tedious process. It's not one that goes likely because next slide, because what you want to do with your certification is use it for the tool to open up the door. And that's what Latanya said that she uses her certification for. Um, when you get certified, you will definitely know that you have been through the ringer uh, because of the fact that it is a tedious uh, process. And so that is the reason why it is so well respected on the corporation side and on the government's government side. Next slide. When um, you are certified, it tells the corporation and the government that you can do what you say you can do and you will produce what you say that you can do also. In entails with also with certification you want to use it on all of your social media. You want to use it on your website. You want to use it at any point in time that you are introducing yourself out there uh, to corporations and to government entities, because that is the first thing they're going to be able to recognize and know that you are able to do what you say that you're capable of doing. And like I said, next slide, next I said, uh, the two areas that do certification on the corporation side is WBDC and uh, Chicago MSDC. And you will be able to, at the end, also be able to connect with both of those organizations in order to get any further information on certification. So um, there are fees involved in um, processing the certification. Uh, the specifics depend on the size of the business and which specific certifications you're going after. Uh, for the MBE and the WBE on the corporate side, it's generally in the low, low to mid hundreds of dollars. Um, and from time to time, there are scholarships that are available. And um, so you really should ask first. I mean, right now, for instance, the Women's Business Development Center does have scholarships that can cover half of the cost of um, applications for, for very small businesses. Um, and from time to time, CMSDC does as well. And so this is just basically based on when funding is available. So you should always ask first. Um, someone also just has asked that it's on YouTube and the question, the answer to the question is no, this is not going to be on YouTube. Okay, what certification is, and like I had spoke earlier, certification is your marketing tool. Certification is the item that you're gonna to use to say when you are going to any type of events. Um, and the first thing you're gonna tell them, well, I'm, I'm certified with WBDC. 
And the first thing is going to happen is their eyes are going to open because they're going to know immediately that you are capable of doing what you said that you can do because you have been well vetted because that certification process takes about 60 to 90 days. And during that time, you will be well vetted so that therefore when you receive that certification and present it to any corporation or any government entity, you won't have any problems as far as them knowing that you can do what you say and the rest of it would be up to you. But what certification is, is not is a yes to any and all contracts. You still going to have to be diligently and do the work and the research and everything it's going to take to obtain that contract. But the certification is like the, the key to the door for you as far as opening that door to in order for you to get a pitch in to able to get the contract. So um, Melanie here is um, actually um, our uh, real life WBE MBE um, who created this um, this curriculum actually that we're, we're using. She's based in California. Um, and I just wanna, I'm not gonna read to you what, what she says, but I would encourage you to take a moment um, to, to look at it. And she's shared this with me um, also. She had uh, started her business, um, started to grow her business, working with customers that really didn't care about whether you were certified or not. Um, and then kind of got to a point where she realized if she was gonna grow into larger uh, corporate customers that she was gonna have to just make a little bit of an investment. Uh, and um, I think tedious is the word Anita has been using, and that is uh, completely uh, <laughs> correct. <laughs> um, you know, it's a lot of paperwork. Um, on the other hand, what it does show the corporations and the governments is that you're capable of handling a lot of paperwork, because frankly, selling to large organizations, whatever kind they are, does involve a lot of paperwork. So anyway, um, she's uh, just one of our delightful people that we get to work with, and uh, and she was excited to be able to put this uh, curriculum together, actually, because it is something that's near and dear to her heart. Okay, now that you have that certification, now you're able to take it and go out to different events, as far as trade shows, procurement luncheons. Um, Chicago MSDC also does an MBE to MBE that they do with um, the Federal Reserve Bank. You have WBDC that just finished their Midwest conference, uh, pivoting for the progress. And it's those type of events and everything that your certification will be good for also because there you will present to the corporations and government agencies that are at those different events that you'll be networking with. And you want to make sure that you participate in all different type of network events and anything that's out there, whether it's pertaining to your industry or not, because you don't know who's in the room. So it is very important that you do uh, spend the time and do your networking. I know a lot of time businesses say, oh, I don't have time, you know, to, to network. I need to be pertaining to my business. But you need to know that that is too a part of your business is getting out there networking because you can't be everywhere all the time. And the, the connections and things that you make out there at all the different events, they're also a tool for you as far as selling your business or your services that you have. Next slide. We have here we have an executive director, Jer Gary Harris, um, which is diversity and contracts as she also, and what she says is that she, she's actually a supplier inclusion professional. She says, I'm from Chicago and I work with MGM Results International Headquarters in Las Vegas, Nevada. I attend events to find diverse companies who are project ready. Now, did everybody hear what I said there? Project? ready. It is important to make a positive first impression, invest time to learn about the progress so that you are ready to introduce your value to me and to my colleagues in business outreach. One of the things to be prepared to speak on is making your business different. And that is exactly what you want to make sure that you do, you do when you go out to the different events and network is that you show the different government agencies or corporations what makes you stand out more so. And Karen will be talking more on it in regards to your uh, combative statement. 
Yep, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I think that um, to segue into this, and Karen, you might answer this question, but there is a question in the chat that said, are there any specific industry-related challenges that we should consider or be prepared to address? As an example, I'm a realtor, and for others in service-related industries. Well, sure, and, and that's really, um, I mean, that's exactly the right question to be asking. Um, it's certainly not um, up to us to answer it today. But what you want to be able to do um, to all of the points that, that Chandra made in terms of why, um, why large organizations, governments, um, corporations want to do business with small businesses in the first place. And it has to do with the perception that small businesses are more innovative and more um, agile, in addition to, to some of the other um, reasons that, uh, that Chandra listed. And so you want to think about what are the specific problems? I mean, frankly, most businesses, most corporations, most governments already have their needs met, right? So it's not like the city of Chicago doesn't have, you know, companies that, you know, pave roads or whatever, right? I mean, we, we, we got those, but we're good. It doesn't, it's not like all state doesn't have, you know, companies that do marketing for them, you know, right? You're not going to sell them something where there's no competition. What you need to be able to do is figure out what is, what are the, your unique selling propositions? What would you say to Gary, for instance? I mean, how, how would you get her attention, right? Not just, well, you know, we sell office paper, but maybe it's the process that you use that makes it super easy for people to, to buy or something. There needs to be some kind of value added reason. And so Melinda, in answering your question, you want to think about what are those specific industry related challenges. Um, so that's, um, that's definitely the thing that you want to be thinking about. And in your capability statement, which is a one pager um, that summarizes your business, you then want to talk about what makes your company different from other vendors, which is really exactly what I just said. Um, and also then more specifically, looking at that from the perspective of the buyer. So if, if I'm buying just pens, just to make things very you know simple, I'm buying pens. And I want my pens to be able to write so that I can write things down with them, right? And you say, well, Karen, you have a lot of pens that are, you know, have, um, you know, green um, on the outside. And I sell pens that are red, right? I mean, I don't care as the, as the buyer, right? The, you know, the fact that, that they look different isn't important to me. Now, there could be times when maybe it is important to me, but if, what, if, my, if my purpose for the purchase is, to be able to write things down. It doesn't matter to me so much what the color of the pen is. So, um, you know, they, the old saying goes, people don't buy a drill, they're buying a hole, right? So my problem as the customer is I need a hole put in this wall. So, you know, solve that problem for me. So now I will turn it back over to, um, I think, Chandra. It, it is it is I and this is actually a perfect perfect segue um, so uh, we talked a lot about differentiators and things that make can make you different with your product or, or service but there's some other things that can make you different and um, that make you can stand that can make you stand out uh, amongst your competition so let's talk about some examples of differentiators so um, do you have recipes patents or is that intellectual property that you have that you know that your competitors don't? Let's talk about production capacity. Um, you know, is there a, do you have, are you, do you have the ability to uh, produce uh, something a lot faster than your competitors? Um, your reputation, years in the business, not everyone can say, I've been doing this for five years. I've been doing this for 10 years. I've been doing this for 30 plus years. That goes a long way. And as a buyer, they feel very comfortable with that. Do you have uh, your sales volume that you can show that some of your uh, competitors don't? 
Are you in a geographic service area that allows you to produce and, and, and actually uh, get products or services to your customers or clients a lot faster? Do you have some success outcomes? We love to hear success stories, uh, you know, solutions that you have provided to uh, other, other buyers or customers. Um, do people know, are you, you know, your founders or investors, perhaps you are known very much out through your community as a person, person or a business that provides a successful service or gives pro a successful, really good products. So those are some examples of things that can make you different and stand out amongst the crowd. Um, so lots of times, you know, we're always looking for a product or service that we can provide that um, someone, our competitors don't, but you may have a differentiator in, within your company already. Next slide, please. So let's talk about Carmen, who's a forensic accountant. Uh, once again, um, and she says, and these are tips from an actual uh, WBE, identify your ideal client. Recommend a solution, review their annual reports, and read articles. So you want to know who it is that you're, you're going to be selling to. What are, what are some solutions? You know you went onto their website. You know that um, they had issues in the past with um, their past. Um, I hate to keep picking on IT, but it comes to mind really easy. Um, the, their past um, IT company. Um, what is it that you can do that can provide a solution? How about that? Um, so you want to read articles and you want to really become um, familiar with this company that you're approaching. Respond to a request. Refer to bids and posting sites and register in the very various vendor portals. So uh, oftentimes when people are looking or companies or corporations in particular are looking for uh, a certain product or service is going to go out for bid, they go into their portals or their website. So many times it's just really, you know, identify some customers or uh, uh, folks that you would like to go after or do business with and simply register yourself through the portal. That is the beginning. Okay, so there's a lot of terminology, um, obviously, in, in this industry, like there is in any industry. So we've been talking about capability statement um, a bit and, and the components of it. I mean, that's a one page or maybe two page, it's not longer than that document that um, it's, people call it kind of like a resume for your business but it needs to be really focused. Um, as we've been talking about, what are your differentiators? You know, you are a printing company and you, you know, provide these types of services, that's great. So why should someone use your printing company um, as opposed to any other printing company? So maybe you have some unique processes, maybe you have a specially fast turnaround. Uh, you know, there's gotta be some reason other than I just need stuff printed uh, because frankly, I'm probably, if I'm the customer, already getting my stuff printed by somebody somewhere. So you wanna just be able to, to talk that through. A statement of qualifications is, is a little bit similar, um, but it tends to be more uh, technical in terms of like maybe if you're an architecture firm and it would be the specific qualifications of your professionals. Um, a request for information is something that a customer or a prospective customer does when they're not completely sure what they're looking for. And so you see this a lot in IT, but it could be in other um, areas. It's typically in professional services of some type, typically. Um, this isn't the same as a bid, okay? This is me as a customer saying, you know, I'm not happy with the way our um, software in our, you know, XYZ department operates, but I'm not sure exactly what's out there. I'm not really sure what I want. So I'm gonna ask the market, uh, to provide me with information um, about, you know, kind of suggested solutions, other options, and so forth. There's not pricing typically associated with a request for information, at least most of the time there's not. Um, but it's really just kind of like thinking about some ideas. And this could be an opportunity for you as an innovative business owner to be able to really show that you've got a very unique approach uh, to solving the problem. 
um, pre-bid meetings, and we'll talk about this a little bit differently in the context of government contracting when we get to that part of our program uh, today. But in the context of corporate contracting, a pre-bid meeting might be more like a one-on-one -on -one meeting with a buyer or with a supplier diversity professional. Um, some of these things aren't even allowed in the government space, but in corporate America, it's not that unusual. And so it might be uh, the opportunity to have, you know, an, an in-person meeting. Obviously, right now, all of these are being done remotely, uh, where you can kind of pitch your product or service. Um, and your goal at that point may very well to be then considered to be part of the next step, which is a request for a proposal. Um, so this, uh, and, and not everything goes through the request for information process. You know. I, could be that I already know what it is that I want and I'm just gonna ask people to, to write a proposal for it. A, a request for proposal or an RFP does um, involve uh, providing some kind of pricing. Um, sometimes it's a you know just a flat fee, sometimes it's more hourly. Uh, it just kind of depends on the industry and it also depends on what the customer's asking for. Um, I, one shouldn't necessarily have to say this, but, but I will, um, you know, read the instructions, right? So typically um, an RFP is going to include um, a lot of language, sometimes, and it, sometimes it can just be mind numbing, read it anyway to make sure you understand what it is the customer is asking for. Because if you're not responsive to that, um, what they're asking for, you know, you're basically wasting your time. A request for a quote is something that's typically simpler, right? It's typically more of a commodity type of item. Um, you know, office supplies are sort of a typical thing that would, would have a quote, but it, it also could be other kinds of, of services. And what you love to hear, I mean, what your goal is, um, is to hear the question, you know, so what is it, what is it that you do? Um, tell me about your qualifications, tell me about your company. And again, um, as, as was said earlier, that the answer here is not, let me start with when I decided to think about founding the company seven years ago, and then I'll give you my professional history. And then, you know, nobody wants to hear that. They, when somebody says, tell me about your business, what they mean is give me a 30 second discussion of your business, description really of your business, right? Who, what you do, who you sell to, and why you're great. And you want to be able to get that down to an elevator pitch. And then depending on the context, you may then have the opportunity to expand a little bit more. You know, so if you have a 15 minute meeting with a, a um, prospect, you know, you're going to have the elevator pitch, but you're also going to have additional time uh, to talk about um, things, whereas you might be in more of a kind of a speed dating type environment where everybody basically just gets that, that minute or so. And that's why it's good to have that written capability statement. Again, that's the one pager. Sometimes people hear the phrase capability statement and think what we mean a sentence. It's really not. It's, it's a one or two page document that shows what you do, why you're great with really specific quantified things why you're great, not just we love our customers, we care so much. They need to be quantified to the extent possible, but certainly, um, I guess I would call it evidence-based stuff. So don't just tell me that we have great customer service. Tell me that you respond to all customer calls within X period of time or whatever, right? So show me, don't tell me. And again, a statement of qualifications is kind of similar to, um, to that. So now I think, Oh no, I have, I have two more slides. <laughs> this is what happens when you do things in a big partnership, which is fabulous, but we split it all up. So um, then you want to prove to them that you want the business, right? And you know, you might say, well, duh, of course I do. Um, but you know, everybody likes to feel special. Even people in corporate America like to feel special. And so show that you've done some research on the company um, and that you feel that you'd be an especially good fit because of XYZ issue or um, situation. Maybe you've done similar projects um, for other large customers or maybe smaller companies, but within that same industry. And that gives you a lot of insight about that industry. So 
the, um, you know, if, if you have the opportunity to respond to an RFI or request for information, you should do that. Um, again, pre-bid meetings in the corporate world tend to not be organized. They tend to be more, you know, one-on-one -on -one type of appointments. And then, of course, what can you do for us, right? Um, if I'm the buyer, I'm not buying just to help you out. I'm buying because my company needs the goods or services, and I think that you are the best positioned to provide them. So, you know, provide the, the request for proposal response. Or um, if it's, you know, just a quote, provide the quote. Um, and so that, uh, you know, that's kind of the next step there. But I say that's the next step, like it's easy to get to that point. Um, it's really hard to get to that point. It can take a long time. Corporations are slow moving organizations. Um, oftentimes they might not be going out for bid on any given thing at any given point in time, right? You know, it's like, well, yeah, we've got our IT contract for the next five years. We're just not even interested in IT for the next five years, right? So that, that kind of information and insight, sometimes you can get through the supplier diversity professional. Um, so you just know, it's like, okay, well, this corporation is not a good fit for me right now. Um, I'll mark my calendar and come back to them in, you know, four years and see what's going on. I also might try to identify subcontracting opportunities in the meantime, um, and also just keep the supplier diversity person, uh, or if you have contacts in the IT department, up to date on exciting things that are happening in my business, so that I kind of remain top of mind for them. And before we transition to government, there's um, a question in the question section that's saying, I'm having a hard time finding contracts that um, do not have union requirements and workforce um, has been very difficult. Um, so do we have any recommendations? Well, I think I'm gonna ask um, our colleague Frida Curry when she gets into um, her presentation about government uh, to, to speak to that. So Frida, if you can kind of keep a note to, to please include that, because that tends to be on the government side. It tends to not be an issue most of the time on the, the corporate side. Awesome. Thank you. And there was another question, but Georgia Marsh answered it um, in the chat. So thank you. Great. Thanks. So I'm going to turn it over to Frida Curry, who runs our Procurement Technical Assistance Center at the Women's Business Development Center. All right. So we can switch over. So good afternoon, everyone. So when Karen said I run our Procurement Technical Assistance Center, um, you may or may not know what that means. And basically that is the, we are um, a division that really works with firms that are interested in doing business with government entities. And as we said in the beginning, those could be city, they could be state, they could be federal, they could be municipalities, like for some of the suburban areas or some of the smaller um, 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 communities. But it's really how do I navigate? How do I understand? How do I figure out what to do? How do I create my path so that I can be in a position to present myself to government agencies in a way that makes them at least pay attention to me? And so, so you may already be doing business on the corporate side and you're looking at moving into the government side to expand because, because I think as someone said earlier, government buys a whole lot of things just like corporations buy a whole lot of things. Um, you may decide that I want to start, my, not start, but I want to, I want to do my, I want to make my space in government right from the beginning. And so that could be a place where you start. Um, the thing about it is that there are many things that are similar along with a whole lot of things that are different. And one of the things that I like to point out that's similar is the fact that when you're thinking about doing business with quote unquote the government, that right there needs to be, you need to dig into that and see what that means. Because doing business with the city can be different than doing business with the state. It's different than doing business with the federal government. It's different than doing business with the tollway, different than doing business with the Chicago Housing Authority. So as part of your entree into government contracting, one of the initial things you need to do is do some research to understand if and how particular agencies buy what you sell so that you can begin to narrow it down to which government agencies you want to focus your attention on. Some people say, I want to do all of them. I don't want to miss an opportunity. And that's not good because that doesn't really define anything for you. And that's just like saying, I want to sell my products to everybody. 
And so doing the research, and I'm sure I'm going to cover that in one of my steps, but doing the research to really gain as much understanding as you can about how they perform, how, what the requirements are for the agencies that you're going after becomes essential. So if we look at the six steps to pursuing government contracts, um, it's about identifying potential prospects. It's doing research to help you identify those potential, uh, potential prospects. And what I want to say is sometimes these are not, the way we list them are not necessarily in the order in which you would do them. Um, it depends on where you're starting from, but all of these things become essential when you're talking about competing in the government space. So we want to ask for guidance. And so that's what organizations like the PTAC centers are, organizations like CMSDC or other organizations out there that are really, there's so much help out there that you can get. So when you're talking about doing business with the government, you really do want to get some guidance because if you're new to this space, you could end up wasting a whole lot of time and experience a whole lot of frustrations that could have been avoided just by gaining more knowledge about how you should compete in this space. You want to obtain certification. So we're talking about certification here, but there are other kinds of identification codes that you would need to get that are important to the particular agencies that you're trying to do business with. I've got a slide that will explain what I mean there. You want to prepare, you want to submit proposals, you want to respond to some of those opportunities that Karen talked about, like requests for information, requests for bids, requests for quotes, because a couple of things. Number one, that gets you used to understanding and learning how to respond. And that also gets you out there. And so even though you may not get something the first or second or third or fourth time, you submit a proposal, but you're getting your name out there and you are creating awareness about your company. And so you want to be active in terms of uh, competing. And you also want to um, set some expectations. We can move forward. And what I mean by that is during this tough time, so many of us are having, so many of our small businesses are having during the pandemic and their businesses may have failed and they're trying to figure out what I need to, I need to figure out what I need to do so I can stay alive, so that I can generate revenue, so I can take care of my company and my family. And so oftentimes people will come to me and say, you know, I, I, need, I need some help. I know the government buys things. And so I want to get some contracts with the government. And the unfortunate thing about that is that competing in the government space tends to be a long game. So it takes time to learn, to research, to build the, uh, to, to, to let folks know that, that you exist, to build the skills that you might need to have. And so I always like for people to think of government contracting as a strategy, as a long-term strategy for the growth and sustainability of their business, but it is not a quick fix when you're having uh, challenges to creating revenue because it doesn't move that fast because it is the government. When we talk about some of the local city of Chicago and then within there, we've got Chicago Housing Authority, we've got Chicago Public Schools, we've got Chicago Park District. Um, so, the, you know, a lot of things with the word Chicago in front of them. And even within the city, you have all the different departments. And so, again, when you do your research, you will, you will begin to understand if I want to sell widgets, I need to understand which department within the city buys those widgets so that I know where I can begin to start developing relationships and looking for contract opportunities. We got the state, we got the federal, and all of them have layers. We have the county, all of them have layers underneath them. And so when you're working with a PTAC, we work with you to help you even begin to identify or how to get information or how to start doing that research so that you can figure out who buys what I sell, who buys what I, who buys from firms that are small like mine, what I sell, you know, so that you begin to create a strategy. And so working with a PTAC can help you do that. Next. So there's a lot of, one of the things about the public space, which is a good thing, and then which can be an overwhelming thing is that because it's public, it's taxpayers dollars, we pay for all this, these government entities have to provide this information. And so you can do a lot of research to get the information you need in order to, to, to prepare your strategy and figure out how do you navigate in this space. And so there's lots of research. It can be overwhelming. And so I always encourage firms to um, get enough research that you need in order to decide, okay, I want to go for this type of agency here or this agency there before you start digging in deep. Because what can happen is you can just get overwhelmed with all kinds of information. But it's a good thing because you can, there was a question that I think that I saw in the Q&A, sometimes how do I find opportunities? Well, almost all of the agencies, maybe all, 
all of the agencies, the public agencies, have um, portals, have websites where you can search. You can put in to say, this is the industry in which I sell products, or these are the keywords, or this is my NAICS code. Is there, are there any opportunities that are in my space today? So, you know, they have all these search tools that you can use. A lot of them will put out notifications about opportunities that are available if you register on their sites so that they know that you exist. So you can, at the, at, at the PTAX in the state of Illinois, there are nine of us in the state, we have something called BitMatch. And so you can register with the BitMatch and so you would get notifications on automatic notifications when an opportunity pops up that's in the keyword or the description that we've created. So you wanna do the research to help you make a decision as to who buys what you sell and what you need to do to move forward. If you want information about things that have happened in the past, we have the Freedom of Information Act and all of the government agencies at all levels have FOIA where you can go and get information. Um, you may wanna see for something that happened already, who was the winner for that contract. Um, so you can see, we have up here review close contracts. That helps again when you're doing your research and you're creating your strategy in terms of how do I compete in the space. It's good to see who has won contracts before. Maybe these are even firms that you want to develop a relationship so that you can maybe say the next time you go forward, maybe I can partner with you. So the research is really critical. Next. So this is just an example of the Cook County's bid list. Um, there's not a date on this, but this is something somebody, if you were, had been interested to see what the Cook County put out today to see if there's anything in there that matches what you do, almost any site you can go to and look. They're all different, so you have to figure out how to hang out in their portal. Each one's different. The state has something called eBuy. The federal government has something called the system for, I mean, called um, beta.sam.gov. The city, you can go to their site where they're posted. You can go to Tollway if you're in that space to see what they posted. You can go on the uh, airport's websites to see what they posted. So there's a lot. That's why going back to the beginning and figuring out where do I need to hang becomes critical. Otherwise, all you'll be doing is collecting information. But this gives an example of that information that's there, it's available, and that's one of the advantages, so to speak, over the corporate space because the corporations, they don't have to post this publicly. The public entities, they do. Um, ask for feedback via no cost individual counseling. Ask, oh, this is just getting, I'm sorry, I was reading that, I was thinking feedback. So when, uh, just ask. There is so much information out there. When I have someone who comes into my office, when I used to be able to see people in my office, so who talks to me on the phone to say, I couldn't find any information. I didn't see anything out there. I couldn't find anybody to help me. That's always really interesting to me because the information is there. Small business development centers, WBDC, we have a lot of information. Chicago Minority Supply Development, we have a lot of information. There may be a business service organization in your community that has a lot of information. PTAX, a lot of information. So it's there, you just have to ask, right? And it's there, and so much of it is free. And so that becomes really important as you are trying to create your strategy to do business in the corp uh, with government agencies to find out where you can get information and ask. Most of us, like at WBDC, CMSDC, well, I don't wanna make this statement because I, I, may, I may be incorrect with that, but I know for WBDC, for the PTAC, there's no charge whatsoever to sit and have one-on-one -on -one counseling sessions. For small business development centers, there's no charge whatsoever. And the state, throughout the state, SBDCs and PTACs are available as well as the services that our two organizations that are hosting this workshop have available for you. Next. We've talked about certification. That's a critical part of this conversation when you're looking at how can I, I'm a small business, how can I leverage that status as a small business so to, to help me be in a better position to win contracts. Karen mentioned subcontracting as a small business that becomes really important, particularly on the government side, because some of these contracts, these projects are too big for small businesses to be able to even handle but as a, as, a, as a minority owned or women owned or a small business or a veteran owned business or some of the other certifications that are out there, you can leverage those because most of the most, maybe most, almost, I would say all of the government agencies have some form of opportunity where projects are set aside, where only small minority diverse veteran firms can compete 
or all of their projects will have a goal. So they may say on these projects, at least 20% of the participation has to be with a minority owned business, at least 5% with women owned business, at least 3% with veteran owned businesses. And in order to prove that you are indeed small woman minority veteran, you have to have those certifications in place. And as Anita mentioned, we send you through your paces to get that. And so anybody that has goals set on their projects, they know that when you come with your certification as a, you know, uh, certified with the state of Illinois, that you have been taken through your paces to prove that you own and control the company. So you need to, in your research, determine which ones are important, and then you need to get those that align with your strategies. One quick thing I want to say is that many times people will come to me and say, I'm WBE certified, and I want to do business with the city of Chicago. And oftentimes I will say, well, with whom are you certified? And I often get a blank look. So it becomes important to understand that different, um, a, uh, different government agencies ex may accept different certifications. And so just because you have, say, that certification, say, with us, with the WBDC, and you want to do business with the city and you want to bring your certification along, it's not sufficient. There are other steps you have to go through. So it becomes important to understand what certifications do I have already and what certifications do I need that align with my strategy, you know, that lays out what firms I'm interested in doing, what agencies I'm interested in doing business, interested in doing business with. I hope that wasn't too convoluted. But anyway, basically understand what certifications that government agencies that you want to do business with, which ones they accept. We have industry codes that are important. Um, so, the, and it, you know, on the government, if you want to do business with the government, they have something called North American Industry Classification System codes. And so that is really industry codes. And so like construction has an NAICS code and computer training has one and food and services has one. And so when you are looking to compete in, if you go up to, a, you're at an event and you have an opportunity to talk to someone on the federal side, the first thing they may say is that, you know, we buy in the next code 611420. Is that, you know, is that the next code in which you, um, so, you know, that you are, that you, that you have, that is part of your business. You need to understand that. You need to understand what they're saying, because I think Karen or somebody mentioned that you really need to understand the language and the terminology that's used by the uh, entities to whom you are marketing your business or service. Frida, I'm sorry to interrupt you. This is Karen. I want to also just jump in to, to reinforce the point of how important those NAICS codes are in certification, especially in the government space. So part of what certification uh, proves is that you know enough to be able to control your business. So I might be able, you know, as myself, I could start a business that's a business consulting business and I could control that. But if I started a business that was a construction business, oh my, that um, would be viewed much more skeptically because I don't know anything about construction. So the, at all levels, uh, people care about what you're certified to do, but at the government level, it's especially important. And so um, we had a situation where um, one of our MNWBEs had, um, certain set of NAICS codes. This was kind of in the IT space type, basically. And over time, her business had grown into doing basically more, um, I, I would call it almost more tech support um, and, and phone support for various things around IT. So then she had an opportunity with the city of Chicago um, and she didn't think about the fact that she wasn't certified in the type of phone support that she was bidding on. It was sort of like one step away from tech support uh, in an IT world. And so it had a different NAICS code and she wasn't certified. And so that became a bit of a um, fire drill to be able to help her out. So as your business grows and mm -hmm. develops, you may need to um, work with whoever does your certification, if it's the city or if it's uh, CMSTC or if it's the WBDC or whoever, uh, to make sure that you have proper NAICS codes. And again, in the government space, that is um, very, very important. That's Sorry for really, the that's No, 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 that's really a good point to emphasize because just because once, once you get that, you don't want to just lay back while your company is evolving and growing differently. You want to make sure that any of the certifications and the credentials that you pull together, that they are also evolving the way your business is so that when you step up and say, I'm certified to do X, 
because like Karen, I've seen firms that like, you know, they were like, well, I was certified with the state of Illinois. Yes, but you were certified in this NIGP code. So therefore, you know, th that certification is, we can't count it. So um, that becomes really important. I think time might be tight so we can move to the next one. But you, you know, you want to understand that there are codes, like the, there was a DUNS number, uh, you know, there are codes and stuff that go along with doing business with the government agencies. And you want to just know for what I do, what are those codes? And that's why it, it's really important to work with someone to help you develop a government contracting strategy because there are all these elements in there. Um, and before you start spending money and doing things, you want to you want to get yourself a nice picture of what that market space looks like. Okay, next. So, um, and I think we've covered certification a lot, but basically the same like on the corporate side, you wanna assemble the documents that are needed. You wanna understand what they are. Um, you want to, you, sometimes people get turned down. And so that's where they can come to us, any of, any of us, whether it's on the corporate side or on the uh, um, government side to help you understand why you may not have been approved sometimes many times it has to do with your legal documents your 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 bylaws and all that stuff so you want to make sure that when you start this when you are starting this space that your business is in order your business documents are in order that your taxes are in order because those are all of the things that are going to come into play that you understand your industry and your NAICS uh, and, and if you don't you can get counseling before you start going through that process so that you are prepared so don't forget to ask. That ask is a really important one because, you know, it's a headache, but it's less of a headache if you've taken the time to understand the documents that are needed to prepare those documents. If it turns out to say you haven't done your taxes and, you know, you don't have your taxes all done, that you get them done. So that helps to make the process smoother and easier if you are prepared. And then when you're looking to go and network, the capability statement, I think Karen spent enough time, I don't have to go over it that much, but the capability statement is really important. It's a valuable marketing tool. One page on the government side is what they like, and you need to make sure the things that are covered and you'll get this presentation are in your capability statement. And on the government side, it's a really good idea to call it a capability statement. You know, sometimes we get real creative and we wanna come up with some really clever name but calling it a capability statement, you can put your fancy name underneath if you want, but you want it to be clear and succinct. And on the government side, they really like it if you've got past performance within the government space, but you may not always, especially if you're new in that, but the past performance becomes really important. And the bigger the projects that you may be trying to go after, the more important that past performance is because I'm sure there's some corporate side too, but on the government side, the expectation is that when you win a contract, you are prepared to deliver that contract just the way you are right now. So the government doesn't pay in advance. They're not going to, you know, they're not going to help you financially. They're not going to help you with the resources. They're not going to wait until you bring somebody in. The expectation is if you win it, you're ready to deliver. And you don't want to win a contract before you deliver, before you're ready, because then that puts a black mark. And then you may not be able to go to that agency again. So that becomes really important because we get anxious. We're like, I see this opportunity, Frida. This is perfect for me. I'm ready to do it. And as we talk and start digging in, well, well no, I don't have that yet. Well, well, no, but you know, that you're not ready yet. So you want to be ready to do work because the ex even if you're a subcontractor or prime contractor, the expectation is you have prepared to do the work. I know somebody asked about unions. The unions gets to be a really... Um, important question, especially on the corporate side, especially on the government space. Um, and I feel like that's that I would rather have more of a one-on-one -on -one conversation with that. The union, you know, the union becomes a big, it can become a big hurdle for small businesses, but it's a hurdle that many people have figured out how to get over. So it's doable, but it might be a matter of just looking at what's going on with your business to have some one-on-one -on -one conversations. So I invite you to make an appointment with, our, with me at, at, at WBDC or any of the other PTACs. Um, planning for next steps, is this still me? No, that that would be me. Okay. All right, great, great stuff, Frida. Great stuff to uh, uh, all the panelists. I think Anita started off in the beginning by saying that um, uh, have your pens and pads or iPhones or notes or whatever kind of fancy device you use uh, ready. Um, so there was, we, we know that we gave you a wealth of information. 
Um, so let's talk about planning your next steps. What are your, your next steps? Um, so there's, uh, Anita talked about workshops and webinars. There are always some workshops and webinars, Chicago MSDC, WBDC, many of the other organizations. I know City of Chicago does, uh, uh, in Cook County, they do a how to do business with uh, workshop or introduction to certification workshop. You want to attend those because there are different various certifications that are out there. And you really want to know which certifications are right for you. Um, my colleague Frida, um, I'm sorry, my colleague, one of my colleagues, they always say, you know, you have to know if certification is right for you. Certification may not necessarily be right for everyone, um, but you want to get to know a little bit more about the, the advantages, the benefits of certification, um, but you can attend one of those workshops or webinars. Networks, uh, networking, networking is key. Um, you want to uh, do as much networking, attend many of the networking seminars that are out there. Um, I know Chicago MSDC, WBDC, we host lots of networking events that are out there. And there are many other networking events that are provided by other business service organizations that you can just really get out there. And then maybe you can even uh, talk to uh, uh, or gain a mentor or someone who is in your industry or your line of work um, that you can talk to and really get some advice from. Um, on, on things that are going on with your industry and best practices. Uh, vendor databases, I think I mentioned that uh, earlier. Um, registering your company, registering to, uh, to uh, your company to work with the companies that you're trying to do business with. That's the way that they reach you. They go into their databases and they, um, they send you uh, information about upcoming bid opportunities, um, and that's how they actually search. And they use that a lot of times with those next codes that, that were talked about. Um, so I know that uh, very heavily, as she said, in the public sector, but in the private sector as well. Those NAICS codes are how those uh, business are, businesses are gonna find you. And then business matchmaking events, those are key. Um, those are outreach events and trade shows. Many of them are do, been, being done virtually right now. I hear a lot of business owners say they like the virtual option because it allows them to participate in one, two, or three, sometimes from the comfort of their home in one day. Whereas if you were going out, you would, have the, you would attend one networking event, have to travel, and that would probably be it. So see what's going on and, and, and attend those business matchmaking events. Next slide, please. So we are here to help. I saw someone comment in the, uh, in the Q and A, they said, happy winning Wednesday. How about that? Um, and that is exactly what this is because you have uh, actually done, uh, give yourselves a round of applause uh, for attending this workshop and deciding that you want to uh, diversify your portfolio of customers and you wanna take your business to the next level. We are here to help. We're here to help you. Uh, I know the colleagues and my colleagues, WBDC, CMSDC, and Nita Hagen, we are all very passionate about what we do. So when we were putting this information together, we went back and forth, forth and back, because we wanted to make sure that we really hit on those really key points so that we can uh, help uh, small businesses advance their business. slide. So we're really just kind of giving thanks uh, to, to, to both organizations. Uh, shout out to Melanie Ray, who we mentioned is one of our uh, MBEs, WBEs, who helped us put together the material, um, giving some photo cred, and also talking about who we're funded by. We are so excited that Chicago MSDC and WBDC have come together to um, two, I will say, subject matter experts in business development combined with over 80 years of experience here. Um, we're here to share this information with you all and that is uh, funded through this uh, EMBA project that we have. Next slide. And what will you do next? Um, so going back to those next steps and just kind of figuring out what are the best things to, uh, for you to do. And then also contacting our agency. We are here to help. Uh, I will turn the floor back over to Karen. 
Well, thank you so much, Chandra. I um, really appreciate everybody's uh, time and involvement today. Again, thanks so much to um, Lisa and the BACP, which is just an enormously important uh, resource in, in the Chicago um, area for small businesses. And uh, as Chandra mentioned, uh, the city of Chicago through BACP does have really very impressive uh, lineup of, um, of programs. I mean, perhaps this one, um, I don't mean to make it sound like this one is necessarily impressive, but uh, if you have questions about doing business with the city of Chicago, you definitely should check out their program. And then just doing business, period. They have a wide variety of programs, not, not only about the city of Chicago, but, um, but more generally. So um, we'll stay on for a few more moments. Um, if people have last questions to pop into the chat that they haven't gotten answered, um, I think that the general answer for many of the questions would be to reach out to um, Anita or to Frida or to myself. Um, so uh, you can see Anita Hagen's um, email is in the chat. Um, I believe also information about the PTAC and, and reaching out to Frida Curry uh, is also in the chat, um, a one-on-one -on -one, um, strategic business, <clears throat> excuse me, coaching session. And my contact information would be the same to call just our 312-853-3477 extension 100 number to schedule an appointment um, with one of us and then reach out to Anita as well. So I don't see any other questions coming up. So I'm going to just take this opportunity to say have a winning Wednesday evening. And uh, thank you all so much. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.